Broadcasting from the Any Hour Services Podcast Studios, I'm your host, Mike Wilson, and you're listening to In the House. In the House is a podcast about the major systems in the house, electrical, plumbing, heating, and air conditioning. Each week, I'm going to have a panel of experts where we pick a topic and we dive deep on that topic. It's meant to be informative and uh, we hope it brings you some value. Today, I'm joined by three licensed plumbers, Ricky Barnes, Dwayne Nelson, Scott Moyes. They have 76 years of combined experience, but they've been in the building and construction industry for longer than that. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having Good to me, be Mike. Here, Mike. How's, how's it feel being on the, uh, the pilot episode of In the House? Feels great. <laughs> Yeah. Scott, how do you feel? I feel really good. Yes. This are, is are we like, making you feel comfortable? This is right where I love to be. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the mic. Behind the mic in front of a camera, all yeah. that stuff. It's cool. Good. Well, uh, today we're actually going to be talking about water heaters, tanked water heaters to be specific. Uh, we know that there's tankless water heaters. We'll do a separate episode uh, specifically for tankless, but we went to social media on Facebook, Instagram, and asked people questions. What do you want to know about your water heater? And I was not surprised, but there were a lot of questions. Some of them were the same, some of them were different, but we'll we'll dive into those as we as we go along. But anyone listening or watching, if you've got questions or you want to know something, feel free to leave us a comment uh, below on whatever pro- platform you're watching or listening this to, or look for those little posts where we ask you for more questions. So anyway, water heaters. Curious. I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but I'm, I'm, I, I had to look this up. But who invented the water heater? Good question, Mike. I'll defer that over to Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I can defer one more time. <laughs> do you, or, okay, do you know <laughs> when? Point. Do you have a, an idea of when? Well, I, I mean, the Roman Empire had hot tubs and spas that, that back is in true. the day. Okay, so looking online, water heaters the way that we know them nowadays uh, is it rude or rud? What's that? Ru- well, how do you oh, pronounce it? Some people say rude and some people say rud. All right. Well, rude or rud, which are you D there you go. That's it. So a Norwegian mechanical engineer, Edwin rude, I'll say rude, um, designed the first water heater that became popular for domestic use. His patent was filed in 1889. Okay. There was a dude before that who invented a, a water heater, but it didn't have anywhere for the, the fumes to exhaust. <laughs> so it was really dangerous for in-home use. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. They've been around for a while. Um, I was thinking to myself, what would it be like? Like, what was life like before we had hot water just on demand at a tap that we could turn on? Can, can you Dwayne, do you, do you, Dwayne, do you remember? What it was like, Ricky? Yeah. Not quite. You guys are old, really. <laughs> this is you guys. Not you. quite. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, but I I don't know. Like I've have all of you had the experience of waking up with the water heater not working? Absolutely. I I, I remember one one time specifically, like waking up and go to get in the shower and it's cold. Like oh, it just wouldn't heat up, and so we knew that it was out. And I I went immediately the boy scout and me went to the garage cause I had to get ready for work. I went to the garage, grabbed a bucket and a drill and drilled holes in the bucket, hung it where the shower head is. And I put a pot of water on to boil so that I could make my own camp shower. <laughs> really? Dang it. It worked. <laughs> it did actually. I mean, it was, it was enough to like get me by, but no one wants to be without hot water. I, I think about, I think about all those, how many of you guys have been to like boy scout camp or, you know, camping like that when all you've got is a cold stream next to you. Oh yeah, that's, there's a reason why they don't shower for weeks, right? Exactly. <laughs> the way that my boys smell when they come home, I can only imagine what people smelled like when they didn't bathe because they didn't have hot water available. Anyway, I don't know. So uh, questions about hot water heaters. A lot of people uh, were curious about water heaters because when you think about the major systems in our home as far as like plumbing, water heater I think is one of the first major components that people think about with the with the system and if it's not working obviously that's a lot of headaches right if you got a a toilet if you got a bathroom or if you got a house with multiple bathrooms a toilet stops working you, you just use the other bathroom until you get it fixed but the water heater goes out and you're like it's no fun right 
I might have skipped the bucket and maybe went over to the neighbor's house, Mike. Just. I can I can see you doing that, but what you don't know about me is being the eternal introvert. Right. I would rather have a cold shower than go knock on my neighbor's door and ask to use their shower. I got that. <laughs> um, let's talk about let's let, so so we're bringing value to people. Let's talk about uh, water heaters. What are the what are the major? We're going to talk about the major components of a water heater and maybe the basics of how a water heater works. Who wants to take that? Well, the the basics of a water heater is that you have you have a, a holding tank where water sits inside of there and it needs to be heated up. So most um, tank style water heaters, it has a burner assembly on the bottom of the of the of the tank where it heats up and basically boils up the water. Um, that flame will distribute the water in the tank and then draw it out to the home. Gotcha. So that that's a good point. So you've got a tank that that stores the water and then you've got some type of uh, heat source in the, your situation, gas with the flame. Uh, but I guess there's electric there's ones, electric right? Ones that have like there. a, they some type of element, elements. Yeah. Have, have a heating element that like does the same that, thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, I mean, I learned today there's hybrid water heaters that, that have both. Um, but anyway, okay. So you've got the, the tank, you've got the heating element. Um, then you've got, I, I don't know, like are, what are the, are there other major components of the water heater itself? There are many components, Mike. You have your gas valve for setting your temperatures for your water. That controls your settings for, um, for um, from 120 to 140, basically, degrees. Um, you have an anode rod in there that uh, helps protect the water heater and make the, length, the time it lasts longer. Okay. Let's go back to the, uh, the gas valve. When you're adjusting the temperature, does an electric water heater have an equivalent part? to that that adjusts is it just a thermostat that regulates how hot those sticks get <laughs> the they, they, rod? they do but it's not on the outside you actually have to remove a couple of panels where you've got live electricity there mm. and then there's some dials on those that you can set to 105 110 120 on up to 160. gotcha and i'm assuming it's uh there's actually a thermostat in there that is reading the temperature of the water and when it falls below it actually just turns those heating rods on it does it, it starts electric water heaters heat at the bottom okay first and then when it can't keep up it it transitions up the up the there's a thermostatic element in there and it transfers up to the top one to maintain as much hot water as we can out the top and then it starts all over again and then it goes back downwards and then heats the bottom last okay cool and then obviously distributing it through the house you've got the pipes when the water is coming into the house is its first stop like the water heater how, do, how does that work as far as like when the you've got the main water uh, line coming in from the house where does it go first yeah not necessarily I mean that your your cold water coming into your home can it can be routed a, a many different ways. It does not have to go directly into the water heater at first. Um, every home is going to be different. Um, typically, you'll see your outside faucets are going to be caught before your water heater. Okay. Um, and things like that. So yeah, it will not. It does not go through the water heater first. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we there's a um, when it comes in, it goes to like a pressure regulator, right? Does it go there first and then to those outside spigots or? Is yeah, absolutely. I mean, the pressure regulator is crucial to protecting your system because you don't really know what you're going to get from the city. And I know that's a little different topic, but but very important. Even when we're talking about water heaters, pressure is a is a big element of the function of a water heater and the longevity of a water heater, for that matter. Gotcha. Now, I know that with uh, with water heaters, like a lot of other things that over the years, the way that they're installed, um, has changed because codes have changed because we've learned um, safer ways to interact with our water heaters. Talk to me a little bit about um, about codes and the roles that they play. Because I honestly I think that some homeowners, when they hear like code, they think that it's you know Big Brother government stepping in. It's just a way to like make the job more expensive or is code really required? So I don't know you guys have way more experience with uh, plumbing codes changing over the years. Talk to me a little bit about that. You know, one of the, one of the things I think Ricky and I were both in Southern California 
during the Northridge quake. Uh, I believe that was 94, something like that. The, uh, we used to just, and I've been in the trade for a long time, and we used to just put what we call the perforated plumber's tape around for an earthquake strap, and we, it was just a real thin strap. Is that that strap that has the holes? The holes in it, in yeah, it? Okay. it's just a little metal strap that has the holes in it, and that's how we installed our earthquake straps back before that. But in 97, after the Northridge quake, they found that all of those pulled out, they broke, water heaters tipped over, gas lines ruptured, and there were a lot more damages from that, and so they beefed up now to where we actually, in our company, we use a seat belt material for our water heater straps. There are also larger metal straps that are on the market as well. But so we see from a cause and effect, there was a code in there, but they found that that code didn't work, so they beefed up that code now, and that's what we've been doing for the last 20 years. What other codes have changed over the years? Venting, venting of the water heaters changed over time. Um, in what way? So water heaters are becoming more efficient. They burn a lot hotter and the, uh, the fumes and the carbon monoxide needs to get out of the home quicker. And so we have to upsize the venting. That's the thing about codes is they are minimum standards. And when they're enforced at the time, the equipment that it, that it feeds met those minimum required requirements and as time has gone on we've increased the productivity of our equipment and it requires more safe features for them to function properly gotcha um, you know i i think the biggest safety feature and the other thing that i've seen is the pressure relief valve temperature and pressure relief valve and uh, the water heaters used to come with those just in a separate little box and oftentimes, well, people didn't know what to do with it, and so they would just put a plug it, they'd turn it on, oh, there's a hole here, I gotta do something, so they would just plug the hole. Temperature and pressure relief valves is a very important safety device for if the water heater gets over 210 degrees, which is boiling temperature, or if it gets over 100, or sorry, yeah, or if it gets over 150 PSI, it's designed to relief water out of that valve. There's a little probe that goes into the water heater, and it reliefs that pressure or the temperature and uh, keeps things safe. There we go. There's the one right there with the probe. Yeah. For those of you who are listening, you can't see me holding this, but it's a, it actually looks a little bit like uh, the spigot that you've got on the outside of the house. It screws in and there's a rod coming out of there and it's coated with uh, some type of material. And you're saying that this is detecting temperature and pressure. And then whenever it goes too high, it, it shoots water. It relieves that pressure. Right. And so there's a little, I don't know, is that called a valve or a knob or I don't relief, know what a relief valve uh, there. So there's a little valve on the side that opens and closes, stays closed, it's spring loaded. So when it gets uh, too hot or too much pressure, um, it relieves that pressure until it regulates back to where it needs to be for normal. You but, know, we've, we've seen that all state commercial where the guy gets blown out through the roof of the house and lands on the side of the curb wrapped in a, an aluminum water heater blanket. That, that does happen. I mean, it doesn't happen often, but when it's not able, that safety device is gone and the water heater malfunctions, they literally can go ballistic and go through walls and roofs and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So um, any other major codes before we move on from that particular topic? I actually had a quick story. Uh, last year I had, uh, got called out to a, a uh, water heater that had ruptured and exploded and uh, I had got out there and it was uh, the relief valve had failed and it blew the entire side out of the water heater and it was actually in a garage and it blew the windows out of the garage um, if anybody would have been anywhere near that um, just because this had failed so this is something that we regularly check when we're out doing our inspections that's a good good point um, I think that I don't know. There's, there's people out there that are skeptical that think that when a plumber comes in and, and checks and tests all of those things, especially a service plumber, I don't, I don't know. I don't know at what point over the industry's history, we ended up getting such a bum rep as far as like people going out, trying to, uh, trick people into Look repairs, for things. right. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so like, um, how, how do you how do you combat that when you're out in the field when when do you, I, well first off let me ask you do, are people skeptical absolutely yeah absolutely do they come right out and say like eh I, I know you're just gonna look for stuff to do like what types of things do they say 
What do you hear? I don't think it's necessary for you to check my water pressure in my house. Mm. And at that point, then you can go through your, through your, um, all the knowledge and experiences that you've had through the years and explain to them how important it really, really is. That's a, that's a really good, really good point. Like if someone says, I don't think it's necessary, you, you've got another hurdle that you have to like overcome, like getting, like, it's very rare that if someone disagrees with you and they're like, I don't think that's true. And you can be like, it is, <laughs> it is. <laughs> that doesn't really fix it. Right. <laughs> so, so what are some of the things that you've, um, that you've said to people to educate them that's worked that you've found over the years? Cause I'm sure there's plenty of people that would be listening now that are like, Oh, testing the water pressure. I'm going to be honest from a homeowner's perspective. I want as much pressure as I can get. <laughs> I think about the water hose that like doesn't have enough pressure to reach the, that last corner in the yard or, you know, turning on the faucet and wanting to me, I always thought like, Oh man, I'm lucky that I've got such good. And when I say good, that I've got such high water pressure because there's no problem with the water coming out. Like, how do you, how do you educate them and tell them, uh, why that's a negative? Like, how do you change people's mind there? I love to use an automobile analogy. Okay. You take your vehicle in to get service to the dealership. You use it every day. It's a, it's valuable. Um, and your home is worth a lot more than your car. Why wouldn't you want a pro in your house to investigate and give you all the knowledge about your water system throughout your entire home? Okay. I'm going to push on you just a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Um, what, I, I get that aspect of like having a professional out there to look at it, but what are some of the things that you, let's say that they're like, okay, cool, you're pro. I still don't think that I need to check the water pressure. How do, what do you, one, what do one you say? Of, one of the analogies that I use is, you know, whenever we go to the doctor, first thing they do is they throw us on the scale. Yep. What's the very next thing that they do? They test get you back in the room, pressure. they bring out the cuff, they test your blood pressure. That's the, that's the second thing that happens with every visit that you go to the doctor. Absolutely. And that's a diagnosis. From that blood pressure, they can tell a lot of things. And it's a very important key factor. So that te checking the water pressure in the home is the same as checking the blood pressure. Now, if we've got high blood pressure, the doctor's going to talk to us about that, right? So the professional plumber out there, if he notices that you've got high water pressure, He's going to want to talk to you about that and how to manage that. Talk to me about what, because like, I think it's, it's very um, useful to learn how to communicate to a homeowner in a way, um, like in the way that they, like what are they going to be experiencing? Like they're not, they're not going to go, I, in the industry, I don't have a water pressure gauge. You, you know what I mean? Like I'm not a plumber, but like, you know, I'm in the industry. I don't own a water pressure gauge. So what are the things that I'm going to notice that's going to tell me, Hey, I might have high water pressure. And, and then from noticing it, like, what are some of the symptoms? Because I assume I, for those of you who are not watching lucky you, you can't tell that I like big Macs and I'm a bigger dude. When I, every time I eat a big Mac, it doesn't automatically go on as weight, but over the years, all of the Big Macs that I've had <laughs> have compounded. So if, if someone's got high water pressure, they might not notice something immediately, but what are the long-term negative effects of, does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know we're, man, we kind of went into a water pressure talk, but let, I mean, <laughs> we kind of got there through the, the pressure valve, but let's, let's keep going. Drips and faucets are one of the biggest things. You can go in as a plumber and they say, I have a drip in a faucet and they might think they need their faucet repaired. And it is absolutely not the faucet. It's actually your pressure in your house can be higher than normal. Um, sometimes they have a pressure reducing valve, regulator valve in their home, and sometimes they don't. City pressure is very high out at the street because it has to supply the entire block. So when we go in and we can adjust a water pressure in a house, it eliminates the drip in the sink. And then you don't even have to be uh, charging them or replacing a, a um, cartridge. That makes sense. Actually, I'm, I've, I just, I figured out a way to bring it back to water heaters because I, it, it sounds like pressure we could like really dive into for a while. So we'll save that for another episode, but that brings us to water heater maintenance, the types of things that you check. Obviously water pressure is one of those. What are some other things that, um, 
Actually, before we talk about what a plumber would check, I had a lot of people ask, what kind of maintenance do we need to be doing? Like the average homeowner, what do they need to do or what can they do that they don't need necessarily a plumber to do? Well, this is based on, on your um, experience and how comfortable you are around it. Okay. Um, there are a couple things that cause a water heater to fail. Number one is excess pressure. That, that's a big um, factor into why they fail. Another is water quality. Um, Dwayne had mentioned earlier about the, about the anode rod and the importance of that anode rod. Um, if you're in an area that has high, um, high mineral, mineral content, you're, you're going to have a breakdown quicker. And so, um, it needs to be flushed out every six months to a year. It needs to be taken care of. And that's something that a common homeowner could take care of on their own. Yeah. That's, I think that's probably one of the most common things that, that people think of when they think of water heater maintenance. So I know that there's a couple of different schools of thought on, uh, flushing a water heater. And so I want to like get y'all's opinion on this. Um, when, when you hear about flushing a water heater, I know there's one school of thought that's you drain the water heater completely. And then there's another school of thought where you, uh, you open the valve at the bottom and then you, um, you, you kind of, I don't know what you, I don't know what your technical term is, but you turn the, the water back on so that it's kind of churning up any type of sediment that's down at the bottom and let that, uh, flush out that way. Pros and cons to either one, like how, how does, how's it recommended to do it? You know, we, with our technicians, we recommend that they, we call it a bucket flush. Okay. And we go in first with the bucket and we leave the valve open, flushing it under pressure through the drain valve at the bottom. We hook a short hose up to it. And when you say it. under pressure, what, what does that mean? So we, with the, there's a valve that comes into the water heater that will shut off the hot, the, the cold water coming into okay. the water heater. We leave that valve open. Okay. Got it. And it does a couple of things that way. One is it, it clears a pathway. If there is sediment, it clears a pathway so that it can flush. Okay. And we, we put three or four gallons in a five gallon bucket and we look and see if there's nice and chunky in there and there's all these little white and gray chunks. Then we think maybe we need to do a more thorough flush. Oftentimes it's just enough to, you'll see a few pebbles in there. And if you do it another four or five gallon flush, it's clear. Okay. And we probably have done a good flush if we do it regularly and things so so you recommend um if someone's going to try this at home because i know a lot of people have a floor drain uh you recommend that they first go into a bucket so that they can see the sediment that they've got right the size of it and if it's big chunks you're like okay you want to keep doing that until you're not seeing those is that is that well right? yeah i mean if you get if it comes out really black water okay there's some things that there's some other symptoms with that. If it okay. just comes out with some, if it comes out as a gelatin goo, which is often what we see too. Um, and, and so the, anyway, and we can go into water sure. heater operation in another segment, but the, uh, you know, it'll clear that gelatin goo out and then you're good. And now we've got nice fresh water down at the bottom where the heat is all trying to transfer. Okay. Uh, that is something that like you say, heat transfer, that is something that I've learned over the years is that the, the purpose of the flush and trying to get rid of whatever's building up on the bottom is because you want to have as much surface area for the water to touch on that burner plate or whatever that bottom of the tank so that you've got as much heat transfer going on as possible and when you have sediment and things um settling on Blanket, the bottom blakening the bottom blakening right it's, the it's bottom. a blanket it's i think of it like a uh, um an, a hot pad or a oven mitt you know it's like oh, that's a there's an there's an insulated barrier that like the heat is having to work that much harder or the water heater is having to work that much harder to get the water up to temperature and it can slow down so if you've got a water heater and um it's not you're not getting as much hot water as you used to it could be that you've got some type of buildup on the bottom very, or something like very that. Very much so. So it can also be like a pancake okay. um, where it can sit right on top and it calcifies in over a period of time. And um, that's when you get noises and grumblings yeah. and things that happen inside of your tank. That was a question that people had, like what's, what's up with the noises that are coming from the water heater? What could be causing that? And is that a sign that like, like there was somebody that asked a question specifically. They're like, I, I've got noises in my water heater, a plumber, not, not us, but like a plumber came out, looked at it and said, you're okay right now. You're just going to keep having this noise. And so they're wondering like, okay, is that noise mean that the thing is failing or is it what you were explaining? It's just an annoyance at this point. 
talk to me about that. So this answers her question. So um, a lot of what you'll hear is popping and crackling and it sits there and it's just fine. It's when it's heating and the flame is burning, you're gonna hear popping and crackling as what happens is that heat, because of that layer on the bottom, it actually turns to steam. And I'm old enough to know radiator boilers and the pinging and the panging that you had in houses back in old radiators. If you're from back east, you're still familiar with that. Gotcha. But it's steam and it's turning to steam. And so you got a little, a little air pocket now that just went ping and it hits the side. And little air things are going up through and making that popping and crackling. The other thing that they, when they hear all that noise, especially when they're right there by it, is when somebody opens a faucet in the house on the hot side or opens a hot faucet, you'll hear this <laughs> and it's the water heater as it's heating, it expands and, the, and it's a big tank, it's a big piece of pipe and it will expand a little bit. Gotcha. And as you relieve the pressure and open up the hot water faucet, the water heater goes <laughs> back in. And for those that, I'm doing nice arm actions here for those that can't see us and we'll, bellows. We'll, we'll and do an <laughs> illustration on the video. <laughs> and things, but those are, those are very common noises with the, especially with our water here in, in Utah. It's very hard water. Okay. So her, to her question specifically, is that a failure waiting to happen or is that just more of an annoyance? I would say it's just for the most part, it's going to be an annoyance. Okay. I mean, failure is failure, but it, but it's leading to the fact that you're, you're not going to get as much hot water out of it. And those are the, those are the signs that you say, it's like, oh, I'm running out of hot water now after two showers instead of three or 15 minutes instead of, you know, 20 minutes or something like that. Because this, the, all this calcium buildup is just building up on everything and the heat just can't transfer through as quick, but things are moving, water's moving in there. There's a lot of activity going on inside. Sure, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to note that, that failure is impossible to predict. These, these systems are working from inside out. And so if, if you know, somebody's coming into your home saying this is gonna to fail tomorrow, you know, they know way more than we do. And uh, I'd like to get that information because you, you don't know what, when that's going to fail. That six to 10 to 12 year um, life expectancy of a water heater is, is, is common. And so if you're outside of that range of a 12 year possibly, and if you don't have a water softener and you haven't had it maintained, yeah, you probably need to consider, you know, saving up a little money and getting a new water heater. And that doesn't happen to ha have to happen tomorrow. Sure. That, that's um, actually, go ahead, Dwayne. Well, I, and I, I'd made a note here on my pad to come back to expansion tanks because okay. we kind of jumped over some of the code and safety features. Okay. Back then, and and this the expansion tank is something that, man, what nine nine two thousand two code I think, it started coming out maybe ninety eight. They started introducing an expansion tank. So for all the years before that, we didn't have an expansion tank. Well, they're required now on every water heater. The manufacturers even have it on stamped on the side of every box. Must be must be installed with an expansion tank, and the expansion tank is a is a tank that's what would you say, the size of two basketballs? Half of maybe. a five-gallon bucket. Half yeah. of two a five-gallon bucket, yeah. something like that. And there's a, there's a rubber bladder in the middle of it, and then it's pumped up with air to match the house pressure is the way it's supposed to be set up. And then the, as water, heater, as water ex heats up, it expands, and, and it, it's called thermal expansion. And the molecules get excited, and they get larger and expand. And it goes in and this rubber bladder then moves the, uh, it moves into the air pocket and makes the air pressure higher, but then comes back down as we open up a faucet. So when somebody's hearing a lot of popping and crackling, chances are they've got, if they have an expansion tank, it may not be working right and, or they don't have an expansion tank. Now you mentioned expansion tanks and expansion tank can be an episode in and of itself actually i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it at that point so that's that's a good job now the, yeah because we come across water heaters that don't have expansion tanks and we bring it up that hey this you know this needs to be added uh type of thing um we also i've also seen pictures of expansion tanks installed on the wrong side because there's, there's a specific place where it goes on the water heater, right? It doesn't go on the cold side? Typically, I think most of the manufacturer's directions say the cold side. Okay. 
Is, is there a situation? Because I'm trying to bring value to any homeowners listening that if they want to go and evaluate their water heater, like, okay, does it have the right kind of straps? Yes or no. Uh, does it have this expansion tank? It's usually going to be above the water heater, like a, a big, uh, or not big, but like that, that tank looking thing above the water heater. Um, how do they know if it's on the right side? So is it most of the time it is cold side? Well, if like I say, if you read the manufacturer's install instructions, it says on the cold water. On the cold water side. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's see. We talked about um, that. Oh, on the, yes, Ricky. I wanted to circle back real quick to when you were talking about flushing the water heater. Yes. The drain valve, once you get a calcium buildup in your flushing, and we were talking about the particles and gelatin and stuff, sometimes a homeowner will grab that bucket, put a hose on there, and they won't get any water out of their drain. It's because it is clogged. And at mm. that point, they will have to then have a professional come out because we then pull the drain out and put a special adapter with a valve on there, which is much larger to help get that uh, sediment out of a out of a water heater. Gotcha. Okay, so that's very good. So if anyone is trying this themselves and there's either not a lot of water coming out or no water coming out, you've probably got chunks clogging that thing up. Correct. And that is a sign that you want to have somebody come and, and take a look at it. Um, Absolutely. Now, um, let's see. Can we, can we do one more? Yeah. Um, so back just a little bit of the how a water heater works. Yep. Um, and the reason this flush, it's all tied in together with the flush. On the cold side, there's a tube that comes, a plastic, and it's called the dip tube. Yep that goes down inside the water heater and it, it ends about six inches or so before above the bottom of the water heater. And some of them have, some manufacturers have little slashes in that tube that get the water. Most all of them have some kind of way to get the water swirling at the bottom of the water heater. As the cold water comes in, it moves that makes in sense. a swirling motion so that calcium and sediment don't have a chance to build up. And then, um, but it comes into the bottom cold and where the heat is, and then it goes out the top, on the top side on the hot, there is no, there's nothing there, it just goes directly out the hot, out the top of the water heater hot. So hot always rises, so we're always drawing the, the heat out of the top of the water heater. Gotcha. I'm realizing now that we're like diving into it, water heater, just a tanked water heater could be several episodes <laughs> in and of itself. Cause I'm thinking of that dip tube coming off and like sometimes it breaks off and that if you're not having a lot of hot, uh, if you're not getting as much hot water as you used to, that's because it's just like dumping cold water into the top, which is right there where the hot water is going up. So there's a lot of things. Um, and so maybe we should probably think about having a water heater troubleshooting episode and a water, you know, all of those things. We could have dozens, Mike. Right. And, well, good news is this is a weekly show now. And so we'll be able to talk about, let me, let me see if there's some other questions uh, here. Actually, while I'm looking for some other questions that people ask, uh, talk to me about, um, we talked about um, how long a water heater should last, uh, or, or people were asking how long should a water heater last, um, and there's, there's all kinds of different ranges, but talk to me about the, the average lifespan and what could be contributing factors to that and why there's such a range there, uh, Scott. Yeah, um, I mentioned that just a minute ago that six to 12 years is pretty common. Um, the manufacturer warranty typically goes to six years. Um, some have extended warranties that go a little bit longer than that, but that's most common. You'll find it six years. And um, we're finding most replacements are happening within 10 years. Uh, actually, that's pretty common with most appliances, wouldn't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So si after 10 years, you know, it's probably done its job. And unfortunately, that's terrible, though. Yeah. So, and, and that's, that's a pretty big range. And Dwayne, when we were talking before the show, um, you were saying that you remember a time when water heaters used to last 20, 30 years. Yeah. Um, what changed? Why do they not make them that way anymore? You know, I, I think it's just cars lasted longer. Uh -huh. I think we manufactured things heavier and, and we've just, un unfortunately we've become such a disposable society. Like Scott said, I mean, 10 years on a dishwasher, 10 years on a microwave, 10 years on a refrigerator, a washer, a dryer. Our TVs are about four years, you know, but that's okay because we can always upgrade to the bigger, better, right. larger one. But, you know, everything is just made. I mean, the TVs that our parents had, they lasted for 40 years. 
you know, and it's just, I think, a society thing where they've, it's either a manufacturing, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll bet you, I mean, I have no data on this, but I would assume that um, it's a lot of those things where manufacturers are looking for ways to increase profits, which mean they can either raise prices or they can save money in the manufacturing process. That might be uh, using a lighter gauge steel. That, Ricky? Perfect example. I had a Sears and Roebuck water heater out in Midway. Um, 32 years old, my oldest water heater ever. And um, the drain wouldn't, wouldn't function. It was snapped off and I had no way to really drain a 75 gallon water heater and it was in a basement. So I decided to go old school and drill a hole in the side so I could put my pump in. <laughs> it took me 45 minutes to drill a hole through a tank. The metal was actually a quarter inch thick. Wow. The tank inside, that's the way they were made. Hmm. A long time ago. Yeah, so I, th I think it could be a combination of, of a lot of those things. And so even though we are associating it to like uh, we're a disposable society, I think that things are just wearing out faster. And it's because they're still having the same, you know, wear and tear on the on the devices, but they're just not made to hold up to as much. Well, we, we, shower, we shower every day. Our parents... It's true. We talked in the beginning. They used to not shower. Our, our yeah, they didn't shower, but, <laughs> but even our parents was once every three days kind of a thing. Mom, mm -hmm. mom washed her hair once a week, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. And so we've had lifestyle changes as things have gotten cheaper and, and, and everything. It's just it's lifestyle changes that we have. There, there, we, that, go ahead. We flow. We flow we, nobody ever fills up a sink and washes dishes anymore. We flow water. We rinse it off with hot water. That water heater's working the whole time while we're rinsing off all this hot water and rinsing everything off and we stick it straight in the dishwasher. We don't bathe anymore. We run the showers and you know, it's just a, it's a different society. It's true. Um, the Ricky, you mentioned Sears and Roebuck. I, I actually wanted to ask this question because a lot of people wonder, I get it quite often um, when I'm talking about different things, brand. What, what role does brand play? Is there a brand that's better than others? Um, and here's, before you guys chime in, my experience so far has been, you ask five different plumbers, you get five different opinions. Uh, and, and so that it does feel sometimes like it is a personal preference, but talk to me about the role that brand plays and some of the differences between them. I think it comes down to marketing Ford. Dodge, Chevy, it's what your preference is. You can go online and check so and do so much in-depth research nowadays and come up with a brand. And there's a top tier three out there that we all pretty much uh, rely on and we favor because as plumbers, we go out and we know which ones are failing because we've been in the field for so long and which ones are, um, we find that we're pulling out because of warranties and and defects and, uh, and, and warranties and things like that. That's a good point. I, I do know that we do have an advantage um, when you look at all of the jobs that we're doing collectively, because we're up to, oh, we're getting close to 40 plumbers now, aren't we? Like, yeah, 37. Yeah, and so when you've got that many technicians in the field bringing data back, like, oh, I had another, this water heater fail and this one fail. And we know that this particular one is having issues. So we do, we choose the brands that we work with, I'm assuming, uh, based off of the best consumer experience, you know, the least callbacks, you know, the things that aren't breaking down, the things that aren't having trouble that are lasting that way. Am, am I correct in that? Or are there re other reasons that we choose the brands that we work with? A lot of homeowners will ask a plumber, what is in your home? And I will always be honest and tell them what is in my home. And a lot of times they, they want to go with what the professional has in their home. That's a good point, Scott. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I think another key factor to why we choose what we choose is, is the company that we're working with. If it's difficult to ha get warranties taken care of, if the, if the process is difficult, then, th then it's, it's, it's more difficult for us to use a company like that. Like if we were to get it from like a, a hardware store, it would be very, very difficult to get a warranty process to go through. That makes sense. You bring up warranty and I actually, I want to get y'all's take on this because I've been saying this to people about purchasing uh, furnace and air conditioners. I hope I'm right. I know I am. 
what's up anyway uh but no um tell me this what what is a what is the average warranty on a water heater from the manufacturer standard six years six years yeah. six years are there some that offer a warranty longer than that and are there some that offer a warranty less than that i've never seen a less than six years there are there are others that go more yeah okay um so in my opinion, if you have a, I, I always, I usually will push people and say that the brand of water heater, unless there's been a recall or some specific reason that that one shouldn't be used, that most of the time the brand isn't going to make that big of a difference in your operating, like you getting hot water at the faucet. And, and so I usually will uh, encourage people to look for a uh, if they're going to shop strictly on brand look for a brand that has the longest warranty that stands behind their product the longest because that's going one of the costs in operating a water heater is repairs down the line so if you have a uh whatever you call that temperature pressure reducer that what do you call it the TMP. A TMP. When, if a TMP goes bad, uh, you know, rather than having to pay someone to replace it, I mean, you still have the labor side of it. So that that's the two equations. One, find a find a brand that is going to stand behind their product as long as possible, and then find a company that's going to be there and be able to stand behind the product as well. Um, am I looking at that wrong? No, that's why I purchased Craftsman my whole life. Lifetime warranty. Lifetime warranty right. across the board. You could drop it in a lake and tell them you dropped it in a lake and get a new wrench back in the day. Have you done that? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's cool. Um, let's see. That, that covers that and that. Any? Let, let's go. Last thoughts on uh, on water heaters. Um, actually, let me go back real quick to we talked about the lifespan. How does a customer know when it's time to? replace a water heater like how do they make how do you guys counsel them in you've got a repair option or a replacement option like how do they how do they choose how do they know what's the best choice to to do how, when do they know it's time to replace well, the water heater? when you walk down in your basement and there's water in the carpet and on the floor and it's coming out of the bottom of the water heater okay you kind of that's kind of a gimme on that so one. a tank failure that is a you need a new water heater yes okay what are what are some others parts and repairs versus cost of new okay being proactive versus reactive okay so that's that's a good equation so we talked a little bit about this beforehand i can't speak to the way that other plumbing companies you know run their business but i know that here at any hour we're very diligent about teaching our technicians or plumbers that like when you go into a home and you're looking at a water heater, if there's, if there is, has been a failure, a part or something, we are all about educating the consumer and giving options. So if a, a burner assembly failed or a, what'd you call it? The, the thing, TMP or a TMP failed. It's a temperature and pressure <laughs> relief valve. We can't just use these acronyms that nobody. That is a very it. good point. So <laughs> a, a, the TMP is a temperature and pressure relief valve. Relief valve. Okay. So if that thing Did you get it, temperature and no, pressure I would next time I try valve. and refer to it, I'll mess it up. Anyway, temperature and pressure relief valve. Got it. Um, so so when those things fail, a homeowner should be presented with repair options. And sh well, here's a question. Should they be turned off or should they automatically receive a, um, a replacement option or should they request a replacement option? Does that make sense? Sometimes we can give them a replacement option, actually do the replacement and it does not actually correct the problem with a water heater. Talk to me more about that. A lot of times at that point, uh, any hour, we will actually refund back whatever that portion was that we did the repair for for if they were to replace the unit you're wait you're you said in the beginning we'll replace it but it doesn't fix it did you mean repair it and it doesn't fix it replace a component a oh, part got it okay which I, is a, a repair gotcha it sound it, at first my mind went we'll replace the water heater and it won't fix the problem yeah okay that makes more sense so you'll go out and you'll make a repair on aged units you can't always predict that some of the fixes will actually fix them yeah. Being in the industry, as long as you guys have, I'm assuming that you have heard of technicians going in and 
I don't know if using a scare tactic or trying to leverage their knowledge or what the customer doesn't know, like what are, what are some things that uh, a customer should be leery of? Like if, if a, if a plumber comes into the house and they experience this, you recommend them getting a second opinion. Tell me, tell me some of those horror stories. <laughs> if someone walks down and takes a look at your water heater and says you need it replaced without doing anything, that's one sign. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's a good one. If if they're if they're out there on an unrelated issue, and they give you options for water heater replacement without doing any um, diagnosing of that, then absolutely, that'd probably be leery of that. Got a you got a leak in the bathroom faucet, and they're like, "Hey, you need to replace your water heater." Exactly. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that your water heater might not be old as dirt and need to be replacing, but it's all about the way that the, the, the approach that the technician or the plumber uh, takes. It should really be a, an educational uh, experience. We, we, we really do encourage our technicians to have the customer, our clients, with them while they're doing these checks. When we do the pressure check at the water heater, we want our customers there so that they can see oh my goodness, that gauge just jumped up to 110 PSI. We want to see between 50 and 70 is our ideal blood pressure of our water heater, you know, of our plumbing system. Mm -hmm. and, and we want the customer to be there with us to see that and watch how we diagnose so that they can see that it's not some just hocus pocus, we came up with drippy faucet, oh, you need to replace your water heater. And so we, we, we try to have the customers with us and encourage them to come with us on these diagnoses that we do so that we can provide the proper and good options. Okay, so we've talked about the lifespan. We've talked about um, how do they know when it's time to replace it. Along that topic, this will be the last question, then we'll kind of wrap it up unless you guys have some things you want to talk about. Um, early warning signs, and maybe we've touched on a few of them already, but give me some early warning signs of um, signs that your water heater is starting to fail or obviously flooded basement, it's failed. But like some other signs that if people start to notice this, then that could be an indication that your water heater's starting to go bad. I would say first off would be less and less hot water at your tubs and showers and kitchen faucets and things like that throughout the house. Okay, so when you say less hot water, meaning the duration that you're receiving hot water it's shorter and shorter amount of time. Okay. What else? Those noises that we talked about. Okay. I mean, they, you know, it, it can be normal, but it's a sign that, you know, it, it needs to be addressed. Okay. It doesn't, does it, it's not supposed to be like that. Okay. You should not have a noisy water heater. <laughs> okay. Um, what about the temperature of the water? Like, does it, do people ever notice that, uh, it's not as hot as it used to be? doesn't stay as hot as long correct okay um, our technicians most of them have their thermal um, that we test the, the temperature of the water at the faucets and uh, that's another one also another one is when you're doing your maintenance and things like that that we talked about the flushing and things like that you can tell at that point when you're putting your stuff in your bucket with your deposits and things like that especially when you do not have a water softener um, which is helping the life of your water heater as well you know, uh, he mentioned water temperature, and we're talking about water temperature. I think it's really important. Back in the olden days, back in the 80s and 90s, and, and uh, probably into 2000. 1880s <laughs> and 90s. <then. laughs> <laughs> no, we used, to, we used to set the water heaters at 140. Uh -huh. That was our standard temperature that we set them at. We had to do that because the dishwashers that started coming into play from the 60s and 70s and things needed that hot of water to sanitize mm the the water the rinse cycle that makes so sense. we set our water heaters at 140 well we, 140 is so hot it's very hot you can scald in less than three seconds yeah. third second and third degree burns in less than three seconds with 140 degree water so the government's kind of mandated some new things and we've changed a lot of things to where now we run 120 to 125 degree water but to compensate for that all of our dishwashers have a heating element down in the bottom that automatically brings, depending on the setting, brings the temperature of the water and heats it up. So we don't need that 140 degree water anymore. So we can protect our our little kids. And when we get elderly, we lose feelings in our hands and our feet and we can't sense 
how hot the water is sometimes. I'm, Would that preserve the life of it as like extend its life if you're able to crank the temperature down? Like instead of having a water heater that's pumping out 130 degree hot water constantly taking it down to 120, does that factor in or not really? I mean, it could. I mean, any, with, with excess pressure, ex, excess heat, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wear on the system more. Gotcha. But that's not a guarantee it's going to last longer by turning it down. Gotcha. Um, just last thought, things that I used to, that I used to tell people as far as early warning signs, it's a good idea to go down to wherever your water heater is and just give it a visual inspection. Uh, one thing that you want to look for, you want to make sure that the venting is attached, <laughs> that it's, you know, that it's venting properly. You don't have cracks in the venting. You want to make sure that you are not, uh, seeing signs of water on the floor because the water is supposed to be inside the water heater, not on the outside. And that could be an indication that things are starting to happen that way. Uh, looking for signs of rust on the top. Um, are there any other visual clues if someone was to go and look, uh, just look at things and say, okay, that doesn't, that's not right. Sometimes the piping will get little, if it's copper piping or galvanized piping, will get little chunks of crust cloud, on it. crusty stuff on it. What is that? Um, it's a leak. Oh, okay. That has happened. It may not be actively leaking because it built a scab over itself. That makes sense. Don't touch that scab because it's hot. <laughs> well, it, or that, it'll 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 spring a leak. <laughs> I, I I had one once where I was pointing out to a customer on the expansion tank. Uh -oh. There was a big one of those rusty festers there, and I said, "It's you see this right here. We need to replace this expansion tank." She said, "What this?" And she brushed it, and water started spraying out of it. Yeah, that. Oh. And I, I, before I could grab her hand, it's like, don't touch that. Oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, okay, so last word of advice. If you are having an issue, um, it's always a good idea to know where your shutoff valves are in your house. Uh, shutoffs going into the water heater, shutoffs coming into the house, so that if there is an emergency and you don't have a plumber upstairs to take care of it, you can at least minimize the damage that happens. Absolutely. Any last words, gentlemen? No, I don't have anything. Thanks for having us. I, I thought this was fun. It Me was. I, yeah. You, you kind of forget that we're having a show and that there's cameras and stuff as we go along and we kind of got a groove. I, I look forward to many more episodes in the future talking about uh, other aspects of our plumbing. I think, I think the more a homeowner can know, the, the better they feel about the decisions that they make to either repair or replace things or to maintain their home because they feel like they're a more uh, educated consumer. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Anyway, you've been listening to In the House. I'm your host, Mike Wilson. Uh, I'd like to thank my special guests today, Ricky Barnes, Dwayne Nelson, Scott Moyes. Uh, we got C-Dub, a.k.a. Bullfrog, over there producing uh, the show behind the cameras, behind the audio. Anyway, thanks so much for listening. Till next time, see ya.